Call a meeting to order. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on the agenda is the approval or revision of the agenda. Is there, <clears throat> excuse me, a motion to approve the agenda? Thank you, Sarah. Second from Rebecca. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. And no one's opposed or abstaining. Next item on the agenda, item 2.01, is the presentation of the proposed 2024-25 program and revenue budget. Mr. Corbin. Okay, so we got here. Uh, here's going to be the third part of the budget. Uh, it'll be the program, transportation components, along with revenue. Uh, we'll go through uh, the slides. There'll be opportunities for questions. Uh, we do have a three-part uh, portion in there, similar to what we put out. We put out to the community. So uh, at any point, if there's any questions, things of that nature, give me, let me know, and we'll go forward. So within program, we got, uh, th these are the primary components within that, athletics, benefits, regular school, special education, and support. I'll be talking about those one by one. So within the program budget, uh, overall, we're seeing an increase of about 4.9 million. It's about a 6.3% increase. Uh, the current projections call for a program budget of approximately 83.1 million, so it represents the vast majority of the district's budget. Uh, just to know on the bottom, you can see the last bullet, uh, from a staffing and program perspective, there are no cuts to program or staffing. That includes mental health staffing and services as well. So the first part of it, we'll talk about athletics, some of the uh, components within athletics, salaries, equipment, contractual materials and supplies, and you can see examples of some of those uh, up there as well. So athletics, again, similar to what we've seen in the past, left-hand side, you'll see the corresponding accounts or, or the categories. The middle column will be currently what we've got for budget, and then to the right will be the actual, uh, what we're proposing for the budget for a 24-25 school year. Uh, salaries, basically similar scenarios, what we've had in the past, contractual agreements and budget to actual adjustments represent uh, the change there overall. Athletic equipment, there's a slight increase there of about three grand, or 3,600. Uh, some of the items that are gonna be budgeted, and that would be a soccer goal, and then a scorer's table for uh, gym one. Uh, CSIRO services, you see an increase there. Um, that's along with basically related to some of the needs and, and corresponding prices uh, from the supplies export. And then BOCI services, you can see is a slight increase there and it's really uh, due to the new athletics purchasing software. Benefits is up next. Uh, main components there being ERS, TRS, Social Security, Workers Comp, Unemployment Insurance, and then there's corresponding insurances being the health, dental, and vision. And then what we have also uh, with our district retirement incentives and 403B contributions. And we'll talk about those. So within benefits, uh, ERS, you can see, and as well as TRS, they're both significantly increased year over year. Uh, basically what's driving that is the rate. And in this case, basically you have a 14.1% increase, or excuse me, 14.1% uh, rate. And then the previous year being 12.2%. TRS similar in the fact of it was being a 10.25 as well as the prior year being 9.76. Uh, and based on those rates and then salaries as they go up, uh, the corresponding dollars go up, in this case, pretty significantly. Uh, next item being FICA or Social Security, basically that increase, uh, that's really gonna be due to your higher wages. Workers' comp being the next one. Um, in the, that case, basically it's increased to a higher projected rate as well as budget to actual adjustments. Uh, disability and unemployment, those are both uh, projected to increase. Uh, unemployment, I think basically just kind of creeped over that $10,000 mark. So we budgeted up to 20 to kind of cover that. Uh, disability, it's really budgeted to actual. We were seeing more in the 30 to $40,000 range from a disability perspective. And that's where we budgeted in that $40,000 mark. Health, dental, and vision. You can see dental and vision. Uh, that would be a little bit different probably from past years where you see it going down. Uh, what we had there is basically we had surplus 
And in those two categories, I really wanted to put it more budget to actual and true that up to really what we're actually seeing. And then year over year as we go forward, what we talk about, whatever percentage increases, so you can see with health insurance, the 7% annual uh, premium increase, as we get those rates defined by the consortium, ideally you'd have kind of whatever that would be, those corresponding percentages, and that would define that. Uh, so it's just something I'm really pulling surplus out of there and going to true it up budget to actual. Uh, insurance buyout, you can see that, and it's really just um, it's small, or actually it's flat year over year from that aspect. So that really represents, in our case, the health, dental, and vision, as well as the insurance buyouts. 403B and then retirement payouts. You can see 403B contributions. Basically, it's just an increased projected increased payments for the contractual agreements. So as uh, corresponding agreements or, or have increases, then the actual corresponding contribution would follow that. Retirement payouts, that increased significantly. That's basically as staff uh, retire, we don't really know, we, we have an idea, but as they go out, there's a corresponding dollar value tied to their contractual agreements. And as those folks retire, uh, there's a corresponding cost, and that's projected what we were thinking next year uh, for, that, for that dollar figure. EAP program free, as well as the flex spending admin fee. Uh, the EAP program free was new uh, from that aspect. We're now required to have a fee tied to it. Uh, that's where we budgeted in for the EAP program that we participate in. And then the flex spending admin fee was relatively flat year over year. Special ed's the next category, uh, represented again with salaries, equipment, contractual materials and supplies and BOCES. And you can see some of the examples there. So within special education, um, the, all salary codes again are gonna be negotiated contractual increases. From instructional, you can see how we went up from about 1.7 million to 2 million. That does include uh, three positions that were added after the 23-24 budget, so we put those positions in, <coughs> excuse me, and then uh, the difference really being uh, negotiated contractual increases for the remaining staff. Psychologists, there's an increase there. It's really salary increases and then some budget to actual adjustments to account for uh, truing that up to actual. And then salaries, TAs, you can see, it includes three surplus positions and some positions added after the previous budget finalized it's really those are based on IEP student needs. So those were tied out and the surplus is basically trying to give us uh, some of the shift in, in an area where if we have more student needs, things of that nature, there's a corresponding uh, teacher or salary available there to be able to fulfill that. Salaries for OTPT, uh, basically it's a decrease and really it's just a, due to breakage from retirements. So again, that's reflected in what we project actual to be. Uh, special education with equipment, supplies, textbook, uh, you can see there are relatively smaller numbers. Equipment's relatively flat, just an increase in needs and prices, similar to supplies. And then you get down to BOCES services, and that one had a uh, slight decrease, and really what that decrease was just high needs projected students, what we thought we were going to have, and it's decreased from the prior year. So that corresponding dollar figure has went down slightly. Next is regular school. Uh, so what you see there is professional development, salaries, contractual, materials and supplies, textbooks, equipment, BOCE services, a couple examples, and then pre-K, and we'll talk about those. So professional development being the first one, you can see slight decrease in professional development. It was basically a BOCE service that we weren't gonna continue. That was about a $3,000 decrease, relatively flat year over year otherwise. Salaries, you can see teachers increase primarily due to negotiated contractual increases, similar to all the others. It does include four surplus teaching positions that we've identified in there. And again, it's one of those based on student needs if we need to put those in place. TA salaries, really the increase is just due to negotiated contractual increases. Subs, there was more need for subs and negotiated contractual increases. So that was projected to come up to uh, the 921, which we think represents more of an actual basis. And then teacher age, which includes negotiated contractual increases, and there were some positions that were needed after 23-24 budget, and those are reflected in there as well. Equipment, contractual materials and supplies. Equipment, we uh, basically uh, reduced that component uh, about 130,000. Last year, we had a significant uh, amount of purchasing that we did in-house for basically primarily the elementary schools with uh, some of the student furniture and things of that nature that's been accomplished at this point. So took that down to the 500,000 mark, uh, basically to keep the budget kind of where actual would be. Contractual, you can see a decrease. It's actually a shift. Uh, you'll see that as we go through the budgetary uh, presentation here, where there'll be a shift to about 300,000 mental health 
and that'll be show up in the support section of the budget, and I'll talk more about that. Materials and supplies, just a small increase there, really, in, in needs and prices, uh, justifying that. Next, tuition, textbooks, and BOCES. Uh, tuition relatively projected to be flat uh, year over year. Textbooks, similar, going up from 356 to 359. And then BOCES was projected to increase, and some of the, uh, the costs there are basically due to some of the student programs. You can see some examples there, everything from alternative education, student programs, DEI training service, and then industrial graphics and copy center represents a big portion of those costs. Pre-K, uh, you can see their conferences, fees and dues, materials and supplies, and outside services, relatively flat. The only thing noteworthy there is probably outside services. What that really represented is just less curriculum costs and assessment needs. Basically, in year one, you're setting those up, and then in year two, uh, it's still going forward with, the, with those costs that have been spent in the previous year. So it's really just for setting up that initial program. Supports, the next area, represents areas like occupational education, summer school, library and audiovisual, IT, guidance, health services, family school liaisons, co-curriculars, interfund transfer, and then various BOCI services, things on there like CTE, hardware purchases, copier leases, et cetera. Support being the first one, occupational ed or CTE, you can see the cost went up significantly, went up about 300,000 up to about 400,000. The cost is really attributed to about 10 seats that we've added. And those costs represent around 9.7 thousand, excuse me, 9.7 uh, thousand for each one of those uh, corresponding seats. Summer school is the next one. We just had a decrease in summer school enrollment. It was attributed basically to the decrease. Library and AV was relatively flat year over year. IT went up about 160,000. That was really an increase in both these software and service. A couple of things we added, whether it be Panorama, student data software, as well as the MDR endpoint, which is a cybersecurity service that we've added. Guidance was the next one that did uh, increase, and basically that was due to negotiated contractual agreements and some budget to actual adjustments there from salaries perspective. Next with support, we've got everything from health, medical, nurses, et cetera, to health, mental health services, family school liaisons, co-curriculars, as well as the interfund transfer. Uh, from a health service perspective, we're projected to be relatively flat year over year. For mental health, this is that budget shift I mentioned a, a couple slides ago. And that's from, basically came over from the instruction section of the budget. And, it's, and we're gonna have a listing of overall mental health services on a mental health summary that we'll talk about. Family school liaisons, increased due to negotiated salary agreements. Co-curriculars. Uh, basically similar due to negotiated salary agreements and then interfund transfer to a special aid code it's projected to be flat uh, in this case what it really represents special ed's uh, summer school portion transportation budget currently we're projecting that our transportation costs are going to increase approximately 328,000 it's about a 5.99 percent increase or six percent uh, current projections call for a transportation budget of approximately 5.8 million so within transportation, you got salaries, everything from like director, dispatchers, mechanics, drivers, et cetera. And there's contractual gas, electric insurance, materials and supplies with fuel and bus parts, and then transportation equipment. From a salaries perspective, you can see here directors and dispatchers, uh, slight increase there being negotiated contractual agreements. The drivers went up pretty significantly. Uh, that was a budget adjustment, really representing more for UPK transport costs that weren't reflected in 23, 24 that we've captured now in the 24-25 uh, projections. Sub bus drivers went up a little bit. Bus attendance uh, went down slightly and that was really tied to actual at this point for projections. And then mechanics, uh, there was a slight budget to actual adjustment there uh, from that aspect with an increase with just negotiated agreements. Transportation from the contractual services, both sees the materials and supplies. You can see with contractual services, there's an uh, increase there primarily due to added needs and rising costs, things like insurance, gas, electric, the routing system, bus cameras, that's kind of what's driving that. Both is relatively flat year over year, and the materials and supplies have projected increase, and really in the area of fuel costs, parts, tires, supplies, et cetera, to keep that to what uh, we thought would be from a projected cost standpoint. From a budget component perspective, again, the three-part budget, you can see administrative, capital, and program. On April 15th, I'll talk more about that from the overall standpoint, but at this point, you can kind of see that three-part, capital being about 16% of the budget, administration being about nine, and then program where you want to see most of your costs sitting around 75%. 
The three-part budget program, I put this in. I think this was something we put out when we sent it out to the community. Uh, this is the program portion. You can kind of see the components there, and it totals down to the overall uh, instruction program. You can see the increase overall about 5.95%, and you can see it by the specific categories there. Next two components would be administration, and again, uh, in capital, so that representing the, the uh, other two components represent about 7.8% and 3.5%. Grand total, if you take the whole budget as itself, it's represented about a 5.7% increase year over year. So from an overview perspective, you know, if you summarized everything, I think this was kind of the slide that I tend to talk about a lot when we had our meetings or, or from our group. It really represented, so you're talking about an increase of about six million, as you can see on that last bullet on the bottom. From a component perspective, salaries represents 3.1 million. I think last time we talked, well, last year, I should say, when we talked, I think Dan did a good job talking about what's fixed on here and what fluctuates based on kind of choice or, or things of that nature. So if you're talking from a fixed perspective, salaries is something I would identify there, 3.1. Health insurance benefit costs, increased rates, you're talking 2 million there. And then from a building security upgrade, we did a 200,000. That was more of a choice of things we were doing. And then both these costs being the programs, software, hardware, things of that nature. So from a fixed cost perspective, you're talking really around 5.8 million and out of the 6 million here that's driving the increase. The security thing, I would argue, are things we need based on security audits. We're gonna talk a little about that with our capital project, potentially forthcoming as well. And that's really what represents that increase overall for, for the expenditure side. So how do we pay for everything? Here's the components there. Uh, three main components within revenue, state aid, property taxes, and other revenue. State aid represents around 31%. Uh, taxes represent about 66, and the smallest portion being other revenue, about four. And we'll talk about each of those components. So state aid, 23-24, we were at 32.1 million, accounted for approximately 30.4. And 24-25, we're projected to be somewhere about 34 million. It's an increase of about 1.9 million or 5.9%. And accounts for approximately 30.7% of FM revenues. Basically, this was a, uh, primarily attributed to an increase in BOCES aid and transportation aid, or what I'd call spend-based aid. And we'll talk about that as we go through. So from a category perspective, you can see on the left-hand side, the main primary categories within state aid, foundation aid being at the top, down to BOCES, high cost, structural materials aid, transportation, and building. You can see year over year on the right-hand side, that increase, foundation aid, and you can see the uh, bullet, first bullet on the bottom. It's really formula-based, resulted in a $1 million increase this year, year over year. Building aid went up, uh, you can, or excuse me, building aid went down, but that increase is really gonna happen in the future when the next capital project is completed. And then transportation, BOCES and high cost are really uh, the next ones that, that increase significantly. And those are really based on more spending, which generates additional aid. So essentially, as your budget goes up, more spending occurs, the corresponding aid would uh, ideally correspond to go increase as that goes. Building aid will be going up in the near future as that capital project gets to the point where it's completed, the spending happens, and then the final cost get, reports get submitted, and ideally the corresponding aid starts to flow from that aspect. Property taxes, next component. You can see in 23-24, the levy was 70.1 million, represented 3.82%, or a $2.58 million increase. In 24-25, uh, we're projecting or recommending a 3.52 as the tax cap. That maximum increase is 2.46 million. The levy increase we recommend would be 3.49 or a $2.45 million increase. Tax rate on a $100,000 home represents roughly a $37 increase. And reminding just everyone that the projected cost is using prior year assessments and equalization rates to get to that number. Other revenue represents 4.4 million. Some of the components within other revenue you can see there, county sales tax, interest, rentals, et cetera. Within other revenue, these are some of the components. If you, um, again, the left-hand side would be the components. 23-24 would be uh, what we budgeted last year, and then 24-25, what we project, and then the increase decrease. The vast, excuse me, the increase, what I would say for uh, the main components, interest income, uh, basically 700,000, we under budget a little bit last year. It's probably more like a million at this point, so that truly represents an actual, so a $300,000 increase. Um, the next thing would be really probably noteworthy would be the donations towards the third from the bottom. That was something we had a one-time pilot payment 
uh, that was going to come in from a donation perspective. Those dollars came in. Uh, we don't have another one coming in in that uh, in that type of scenario. So uh, that went down to 365. The next two uh, really represents kind of what I would want to talk about a little bit. So how do you balance the budget? So in the previous year, you can see use of reserves 250,000 and then assigned fund balance of 69. So as we talked about, I think one of the slides is we have retirees and things of that nature, we are able to use in some case reserves. So our EBLAR reserve, for instance, there's a portion of that we can use. And then in our scenario for the capital project, we're, we're gonna be proposing to go out, we would talk about using $860,000 of, of funding there to be able to fund that capital project to minimize the taxpayer impact with that. So out of that use of reserves, that 1,099,000 number that's sitting there, uh, 860,000 of it, the vast majority is represented by that capital project. There's some EBLAR reserve that's in there to represent the other portion. So you can see that that's basically the, the gist of that 840,000 uh, increase year over year. Signed fund balance, that remaining portion represents about $700,000 increase or 695,850. That's the balance needed to basically to balance the budget. Um, so that's what that number is. I think historically you've probably been somewhere in that five to 700 range. Last year we would have been the same, but we ended up uh, going out to the 3.82% tax impact instead of going to 2.98. When we went to the 3.82, all we ended up doing was reducing assigned fund balance down to 69,000. If we would have went down at 2.99 or whatever that number was, that number would have been more like 700,000. So that represents the kind of the year over year difference and, and why that was that significant. So the revenue budget overview, again, similar to what we did with expenses, how do you describe everything in a kind of a quick nutshell? You can see there, state aid represents $2.1 million increase. Again, foundation aid, trans aid, BOCES aid were the three primary candidates. Tax levy, 2.4 million, represents a 3.49% tax levy increase. And other revenue has increased about 1.5 million with the vast majority of it being fund balance and reserves. So overall, if you add them up, six million, that also, excuse me, that offsets the six million with expenditures, and that's kind of uh, the two summaries from that aspect. So next steps, uh, overall budget on April 15th, we'll talk about that. Uh, at that point, um, that we'll be discussing uh, the three categories, we'll be talking about pretty much everything over again to go through it, give you guys a chance to marinate on everything, and then ideally we'd be adopting that same evening uh, on April 15th, and the budget hearing May 13th, and then a vote on May 21st. I know it was a lot, but uh, hopefully it made sense. And if there's any questions, we can kind of go through those. Great presentation. Questions from the board? Yeah, Fred, just on the pre-K instruction, mm -hmm. how do I see in the presentation, I, I'm sure it's included in your slides, but we get funding from the state, which then we pass through to our third party providers. Correct. How much is that and where do I, where do we see that in the budget? So from a pre-K perspective. Um, For you, PK, I'm sorry. Yep, that's fine. So what we get is the, it, it's, it's federal funding and that funding uh, basically we, we pass through to our providers at a 100% rate. So everything we get in goes back out to those providers and in reality actually doesn't include transportation. I think you saw my, my comment or my note there talking about we pick up that transportation cost. So that's where the money comes. This is in addition to how are we gonna do from an instruction perspective, curriculum, things of that nature, uh, conferences, that's something that our burden is with our general fund that we're paying for out of general fund coffers to fund UPK. Okay. Did I answer that? Yeah, I guess what I was looking for, Brad, and, and you don't have to do it tonight, come back with it April 15th, it's fine. I'm looking for, for UPK altogether between the amount that we pass through plus what we fund in our budget, what do we spend on UPK? I'm just trying to be transparent to the community to say, listen, we. We're, we spend more than, I look at this slide, there's uh, I think $10,000 in the budget next year. Well, it's 10,000 plus transportation plus some federal pass through. So I'm just looking um, if we can just talk can about Can I phone that. a friend? Pardon? Can I phone a friend? You can phone a friend, but really it can wait till April 15th, it's, it's fine. It's, I can crunch the math, but maybe I'll let her talk and I'll crunch. Well, I'll just share, I feel like the slide is just a little bit misleading because like the conference, that's my allotment as an administrator. We don't, we don't pay for conferences for our UPK teachers. So that's the allotment that administrators get. It's just that I'm kind of shared between UPK and special ed. So 
that actually all of this is the outside service part is the only part that's related to um, what we provide to UPK. So we've purchased a curriculum. Next year we're um, purchasing Hegarty so that we're starting some phonological awareness work at that level as well. So that's what that's what you see here. Um, I think I've got, how many kids do we have in the program? From this year, 116. And I think it's 5,400. It is. So I think your question really is how much money is going out the door. So she kind of gave you a little bit of background with the four components here. There's another 627,000, give or take, that goes out the door that we receive in, and it goes passes through 100% to the providers. So if you think about it, it's 5,400 per student times 100 and whatever she said, 160 116. students. Okay. That's what's going. So as we go up in enrollment, so I think next year we're going to go up to 130? 135. 145. So we'll get to 5,400 again. But the full amount of the 5,400 times the 145 goes out the door to those corresponding providers. Right. And plus we also kick in for transportation, Correct. right, which we don't bring out separate. So I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to say or what I'm trying to get to is, is for folks watching the live stream that our UPK program that the district, including the pass-through funding plus what we found out of our budget, is approximately a million dollars a year, right? That's what I was trying to get to. I was trying to get gotcha. to what is that bigger number because if you, if you just look at this presentation in a vacuum, you look at this and say, wow, pre-K pre instruction is you know, approximately $11,000 according to the slide. Well, it's, it's not that, it's a much bigger number and that was just what I was trying to get to. I like the 11,000 number. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's one of those and it's a good point, a good topic, we can certainly add to it. Um, it's the 5,400 and I can add a comment on there, but it's 5,400 we receive in. We've, the contract's negotiated through, that, that, that money 100% passes through to those providers. As we increase students, the corresponding 5,400 goes back out to those providers. It does not include transportation. I think last year we figured somewhere in the ballpark of about 400,000 was where we were at from a UK, UPK perspective based on the routes that were run and the corresponding drivers that were driving them. I don't think it probably varies too much from whoever's driving them right now to the corresponding routes. Um, as we add more kids, it may change a little bit, but maybe there's a bus stop involved, so it kind of blends as far as the rate, that kind of thing, and it's not as expensive, but my guess is it's probably still, like you talked about, somewhere in that ballpark of a million. It's probably a safe number. Yeah. Rebecca? Thanks, Brad. That was a great presentation. Uh, I'm interested in the BOCI services, specifically the, the CTE program and some of the educational, yeah. alternative education that's in the line different line item just obviously it looks like the bulk of the CTE is the 10 new students I'm just curious from a practical perspective how do we know projected enrollments now for next year is that decided at some point in the middle of the year and then does that reduce costs in regular education um, if those students are, are taking advantage of the CTE program this may be more of a programmatic question. I'm just, I'm just interested how we know that, how it works, and then how we project it into the budget. I might phone a friend on that one too, but I'm gonna go, I'm gonna give a little bit of a, uh, some of the answers. So what we do, um, there we go. So the budget basically, I'm gonna back you up. So the budget starts for me somewhere probably around November. I roll everything forward, get it going. BOCES itself is submitted out at the end of December. So we have meetings anywhere from between November and December. So specifically, if we're talking special ed, we've got a list of students from the services they receive, um, what those project, who those projected children are, students are, and then what those corresponding services we think they're going to have. You're not gonna know, you know, obviously, if certain people are gonna move into the district, et cetera. You may have some surplus built in a little bit because you could have a high need student that could get up to anywhere the 130, $140,000 range. So, some costs are also going to come through and they come through at what you had from the prior year and it's just basically who were the students that attended certain programs and it's billed that way some of them are based on what you project and then what here's what your number of seats you're going to need everything you know they, they could be involved from that aspect of it so amy and i are basically heavily involved from that where by december you're projecting out what both these related costs are from that aspect if there's more i'm going to I'll put my former principal hat on. Those of you who have children or had children um, go through our district who are middle school or high school age know that we start our scheduling process in January 
as students are starting to select courses for the following year, we're then able to determine sectioning. So it could have an impact on general education just because we might not need as many sections of a particular course, but CTE is gen ed. Um, so as children are choosing what they'll take the next year, that's how we're then able to say to Brad, this many students are going to this particular program. You're welcome. In BOCES also, ANS programs, for example, the firefighting, EMS, which is held east of here. So as new programs come online, students may show an interest where there hadn't been an interest before. Well, related to that, um, so if we end up not having as many students enroll in those programs, is, is this, we pay per student, not. It, this is just a budgeted amount, right? It's not just like a flat contracted amount that we have with BOCES. No, they're per student cost for, okay. the, for the vast majority, no. The trick, I mean, I think that the trick is that would be the question I'd be asking me probably for you guys and, and Dan will ask me at some point, it's just a matter of when. Um, but it's, what, how, do you, how do you handle everything? A lot of all the unknowns. And that's the big thing when you're putting this together. You have your projections. You know, it's kind of a crystal ball effect from the special ed perspective where you don't. So how do you account for it? Because if you run a budget very, very tight, then you get to the risk of what, you know, opportunities or what situations you're not going to be able to do because you haven't budgeted for it. Or what are you going to be able to, you're going to have to do from a special ed perspective that you got to go find the money. So it's kind of finding the sweet spot, I guess, similar to the expl explanations I used to use in my previous district is kind of where do you have a, a checking and savings? You know your, your consistent bills are gonna happen every month and that's your checking. Your savings established to where there might be something good that you're gonna do, vacation, whatever, but it's also those where if the roof leaks or if you're gonna have a situation where if you got uh, students come in with high needs, things of that nature, you can cover that. The next question I would ask, okay, well if you have, and none, if everything breaks you know, right, what do you do with that money? That's where you start to ideally identify reserves. If there's gonna be capital projects in the future or programs or initiatives that you really wanna invest in, Ideally, you have some of that surplus funds to go through and apply it towards it. So this budget represents, I think we've got somewhere around $2 million built into this for actually what it would be surplus or the question, I think you've seen me make some comments on here about surplus jobs or, or you know, positions that are sitting there surplus positions. So you've got some of Amy's portion that probably represents almost half a million. But if they come in at $125,000, $140,000 a pop, that's four kids and it's you know, for some people, it's kind of overwhelming to see those costs, but it's everything from you see a capital project with what we're going to do at 15.4 million. It doesn't look like a lot, but those costs at the, you know at today's prices and things of that nature, like playground equipment, I was I was amazed at some of those. So you got a 110 million dollar budget, you're running a two million dollar surplus. It's not, there's, you know, it's pretty lean uh, from that aspect. So I do want the people recognizing that fact. A lot of where you saw me bring down everything from uh, some of the, in, the vision and dental insurance and things of that nature, it's to run this thing close to actual, will be very transparent from the board as well as, well as from a, a budgetary perspective of kind of where we're at. Um, and ideally, if we do a good job with it, you know, we keep taxes low, we still able to achieve everything from a program perspective. Are there other questions? Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Uh, going back to slide three, just to highlight something that you which, which slide then? slide three okay um and i know i've spoken to you about this before but the fact that you are making sure that there are no cuts to program and staffing i think is very important mm -hmm. um this means that what our children and our community are offered are not impacted in a negative manner and i would like to commend you for making sure that that's been a priority as you've approached the budget this year and last year so thank you for doing that you're welcome. Well, thank you guys. I mean, it, it's really, it's a joint, you know that, it's a joint mission from that aspect. I believe we're all here for, for one reason, and it's the kids. And so my main purpose, I believe, is to support, you know, the teachers and the principals and things of that nature to make sure the programs and services can keep going. The rest of it, you know, we're going to figure out. You guys are going to see, you know, in certain districts, some local and nearby, there's been cuts. We don't have any projected. Uh, this budget will work. Uh, we'll, we're going to make it work and if there's certain things that pop up that's why you put reserves in place uh, everything that we've done we've spent a lot of time a lot of effort and energy going into it and making sure projections make sense so um, that's 
you know, it's with that initiative fully in mind. No program, you know, or keep the program and no cuts. And it's under the tax levy limit with our projections. I know it'll be finalized April 15th, but right now we are not projecting a super majority like some Correct. districts. Correct. Um, thank you, Mr. Angelina. Carmen, for yeah. the presentation. Thank you. Uh, I had a question. Um, I noticed that the mental health budget increased from zero to over um, $4,500,000. I was just wondering how this was determined. So that one really was just a shift of where it was in the budget. It was, it was basically zero in that budgetary category in the prior year. But excuse me, in the prior year, it sat in a different category in support and, or, and then it moved over into instruction. So it wasn't truly an increase of 435. It really sat over in about 300 and some thousand in the previous year. And it just rolled over to a different part of the budget where all mental health got captured. So if you really think about mental health this year overall, uh, the increase is really just due to, you know, wage and increases from that aspect and then some budgetary adjustments at the most. Services wise from mental health, I, it was something I really debated about putting into this to talk about it and it didn't really drive the budget. Last year where I talked about mental health, it was really something that there was, we added a lot of different programs or services. We had some staffing, things of that nature, so it drove the budget. And this year we really maintain all services. Nothing's been cut, if anything. Uh, we've been looking at kind of how we're going to keep to do things in the future. So from an overall cost perspective, it only has went up really a, a small portion and it's really just really related to wage increases and then some budget to actual adjustments. Okay, thank you so much. Um, another question, I'm not sure how this is normally determined, but I noticed that um, for the teacher budget, mm -hmm. um, there was room for like, room for like four extra positions. How are How's number four determined for that? So what we do is kind of similar to what I was just talking about from a special ed perspective. The first thing we do, uh, everything from like TAs, you're going to look at what the students have from an IEP perspective. Do those corresponding students have a corresponding TA that would relate to that? Similar in, on the instruction side, what do you have for your numbers? So you'd have some folks from admin who would be looking at what do we have for projections for enrollment? What do we have for staff sizing? And then what do we have currently for those teachers? Do we have to right size at anything where there might be another class that gets added and therefore we're gonna need a new teacher or an additional teacher to be able to cover that? Those are probably some of where you see the surplus teacher to come in, or if you have something where you have an increased student's numbers that come in, or you know, in the future, if we have a micron impact, things of that nature, that's where you'd see some of the surplus uses potentially. I just want to add my thanks, Brad. I know it's hours and hours of work and maybe a few sleepless nights. You and Cheryl and all of your team, we appreciate the effort. Thank you. Thank you. It's always interesting waiting for that budget vote and it finally gets passed, then we just turn over and great, now we do another one. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you what you thought I was going to ask. Um, I thought I was reading you, but no. Yeah. So, I'm just I'm just trying to figure out a number, and I, I don't actually need the answer. It's this is more theoretical. Is the discussion we had last year at the same time was that we were at the tail end of the state finally making good on the state's obligations for foundation aid, which had been going up at a pretty significant amount mm -hmm. each year, and we knew that was the end of it. And as you showed tonight, the foundation aid increase for this coming year is only a million dollars compared to much more significant increases the last year. Yep. So the number that I wasn't expecting to see, which I'm very pleased to see, is that last year state aid was 30.4% of FM revenues. Mm -hmm. This year state aid, even with a much lower foundation aid increase, is actually slightly more than that. I think one of our great fears last year coming into the unknowns of this budget cycle was that the local share was going to go up at a much higher percentage because the state contribution was going to go low. So to have been able to balance this out to keep that number flat, if not slightly in our favor, is I, I understand where and how you did it, but I, I think it's important that everybody understand the work that was done to be able to do that to help you know, the community that's ultimately paying for this. It's, it's, it's tremendously to their benefit the way that was done. So I'm super appreciative of that. 
I have one question, but I think it's really more for Craig. Um, you had given us some materials for tonight for, I presume, for executive session that had costs in it. I assume that's not in this budget. Okay. Just wanted to make sure that I wasn't missing that somewhere in here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to add to your first comment, Dan. So it's interesting, you know, we had a meeting last week with a lot of my counterparts, and um, you're starting to see some of it kind of come out. So JD with, you know, potentially 11 positions that were going to be cut there, and my previous district is going to be doing some things as well. Um, foundation aid, it, it was, you know, I was really thankful. I mean, two years ago, I'm looking at how are we going to go compensate because they're actually going to cut foundation aid, you know, my previous district. So they're going to go try to figure out the opposite of where we're seeing this increase. It's re remained flat for, you know, lots and lots and lots of years. Now all of a sudden they're facing it where it's going the other way because, you know, unbeknownst to them, enrollment, well, they did know enrollment was decreasing, but you've got folks that have been, you know, located on their properties for quite a long time. They don't have a lot of new housing development, so they're not really sure what they're going to do. So my point is you're going to see a lot of other districts that aren't going to have the type of situation that we have. I'm thankful I hate, you know, the, the, the idea of the fact that, you know, we're comparing ourselves to other districts from that aspect. But if you really, you know, did it or you are going to, we're very fortunate from that aspect. So, you know, back to Cindy's point, you know, we aren't going to be cutting any programs or services. You are going to see them and other ones because of basically the aid decrease or, you know, things of that nature. A lot of folks, when they managed, you know, the federal stimulus money that came in, some did a real good job with it and us being one of them and some other ones weren't as fortunate to be able to do it. They had to use it to offset some of their expenditures and keep using it. So that is the good thing, you know, from that aspect. So I am thankful we had a great team. So thank you. Are there questions? Um, Brad, I, I, uh, I'll take the opportunity to put the legal disclaimer out there for you. So your projected state aid is mm -hmm. just that. The state budget hasn't passed yet, Correct. right? Correct. So that is the number that we believe that we're getting that through the first runs that Albany has produced for us that we think that we're going to get. Correct. However, disclaimer to all that are watching, that if the state budget uh, gets delayed and or the number changes, that could change our numbers that you presented tonight. So I just want to make folks, folks aware uh, and ask our good friends in Albany that anything they can do to pass the budget on time would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, you, you bring up a good point. So usually at the overall budget, this would be kind of be where I get to that topic and, and how I haven't passed. It really comes back to those two lines again uh, on this other revenue slide being used to reserves and assigned fund balance. So if we aren't as fortunate as what they do, or if we are more fortunate, this is usually where I go in and I would recommend that we adjust assigned fund balance from that aspect. The nice thing being, you know, where we're at at 765,000, I've got some friends doing what I do for a living and they have budgets that are much, much, much smaller than this and they're at that number already. Um, that's where I would recommend that we do anything. I would keep program and services right exactly where it is from that aspect. It's been put a lot of thoughts been into that one. So anything we do have, that's probably what I would recommend and if it's something drastically different, we'll need to talk from that aspect. But we've had pretty good luck in 10 years. It hasn't been too tragically different. If it was, it was usually favorable. And I can find a way to find favorable. So, I was going to save this for my legislative liaison report, but clearly we're not going to get a budget by April 1st, since that's Monday. But it is heartening to me that both our Assembly and Senate are working hard on our behalf because they want to uh, restore all safe, harmless foundation aid cuts and actually provide a minimum 3% uh, foundation aid increase for all districts, which you know, if they succeed, that would be good news for next year. Uh, they're talking about allocating another million to study foundation aid, get that formula right, finally, maybe. Um, and of course, increasing funds for kindergarten. There are other things too, but I am feeling pretty good about what our legislators want to do. I'm going tomorrow and I will be talking to them in Albany, so. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to item 2.02, President's Report. 
Um, just a reminder to members of the community that the upcoming budget election, um, there's also a board of education election. Um, anyone interested in running for the board can submit a petition to the district office by April 22nd. And there's additional information on our website as to how you can run for a seat on the board of education. Dr. Tice. Thank you, President Mims. Uh, superintendent's report, the backup information is in your board docs folder. Uh, going through, capital project update, the FM High School Capital Improvement Project begins to accelerate with the anticipated demolition of the pedestrian walkway bridge that connects House 1 to House 2. Beginning this week, crews will begin to remove the windows adjacent to the bridge in advance of the demolition, which is scheduled for early to mid-April. These windows and the integrated PCB containing caulk will be removed during the second shift from the outside of the building and disposed of accordingly. A full wall partition will be installed on the inside of the hallways to not only protect the students and staff during the window removal, but also to act as a temporary outside wall until the pedestrian walkway bridge is demolished. Under UPK update at this time, we have 117 UPK children registered for the upcoming year. As such, we will not need to host a lottery if registration closed today. Nevertheless, we are advertising via Parent Square this week in order to see if we can elicit any new registrations before the March 31st deadline. School start time study. Uh, what is exciting about the aforementioned progress on the demolition of the pedestrian walkway bridge between House 1 and House 2 is the initial work on the new expanded two-level cafeteria that will allow our staff to serve all of our students lunch in the middle of the day. Coupled with an outdoor seating area and a new courtyard adjacent to the cafeteria's lower level, the expanded cafeteria will feature three food court stations, serving a variety of culinary options, including the Oak Tree Circle Cafe, Hornet's Hive, and the Courtyard Grill. This expanded cafeteria is the linchpin to the district's efforts to change our school start times in order to adhere to the current sleep research on adolescents and our community preference gleaned from the surveys and focus groups. Depending upon if the cafeteria construction remains on schedule, we anticipate that the earliest the school start times will switch will be in September of 2025 and the latest would be September of 2026. Our school district's communications specialists are in the process of developing a series of infographics to share our plans with the community. Under mental health task force update, our mental health task force met uh, last week to review the recommendations uh, based in part on the feedback garnered from the student school climate and culture survey as well as the recent results from the faculty and staff school climate and culture survey. The facilitators from the mental health task force are planning to attend the April 15th board meeting in order to provide a status of their work. The mental health task force eagerly awaits the results from the parent guardian family school climate and culture survey, as well as the triangulation report from our third party vendor research and marketing strategies out of Baldwinsville, which will compare the results of the student, faculty and staff and family surveys. The mental health task force membership is also making plans for a joint meeting with our district DEI committee in mid June in order to compare progress and to perhaps find a partner in common ground with respect to similar recommendations and collaborative action planning. Under capital project proposition on roofing and safety and security, this is a result of our recent facilities committee work. As you are aware, where the district will be putting forth a smaller as compared to our more recent larger capital projects at Wellwood and the high school, a smaller capital project proposition on the ballot along with this year's annual budget vote, bus purchase proposition and public library referendum. 
The proposed capital project will address the roofing needs in most of our school buildings, as well as some of the top safety and security recommendations from our recent school safety and security audits this past summer. The specifics will be referenced in the soon to be published spring district newsletter, as well as the annual budget vote district newsletter. Under Wellwood Musical, I'd like to extend my sincere appreciation to the student thespians and their faculty advisors on the recent successful production of Annie Junior this past weekend at Wellwood Middle School. The performance was outstanding and the cast numbered over 80 students both on stage and behind the scenes. Well done in Hornet Pride. And then speaking off the cuff, I don't want to steal anything from our student board member talking about the dance marathon, so I'll steal from Mr. Corbin. Both he and I returned today from uh, Utica National Awards Assembly, where the district garnered uh, yet another Titanium Plus Honors School Safety Award. So congratulations to our school's uh, BOCI safety officer, Kelly Nish, and everybody that's part of the safety committee that works towards this every year. That ends my report. Thank you. Are there any questions for Dr. Tice? Moving on to committee representative updates. Uh, I think we could so nothing from audit um, or community relations. Got me if I get one wrong. Um, facilities met on the 21st. Is there an update? Dan? I, no, we continued the same discussions about the current state of the high school project and the upcoming facilities referendum at the vote and same information, same critical need, not you know the difference between wants and needs. This is not wants, it's needs for this vote that's coming up and it's very critical that it be addressed that way by the community and passed so that we can provide the right learning environment for the students and teachers. So we just continued that discussion. Policy committees meeting on April 12th. Uh, DEI committees meeting April 17th. Um, Mental Health Task Force met on the 20th. Yes, and Dr. Tice did a good job summarizing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, Daryl, did you have anything else you want to add for your legislative liaison report? Only that, as I said, I'm going tomorrow to Albany the primary focus tomorrow is to uh, close the loopholes, uh, particularly around retailers of vaping products. Uh, it's a serious problem, as you all know, in our state. And uh, there is a bill, there's a, a Senate bill and an assembly bill that we're promoting. NISBA is, is uh, calling us to their uh, legislative liaisons from across the state attending tomorrow. So um, I'll report on that when I return. Thank you, Daryl. Um, and student board member, Angelina. Thank you. Um, so most importantly, this Saturday at the high school, Dance Marathon was held, and um, the DMMCs have, well, through that one event, they have raised over $100,000 uh, and over 300 students in attendance. That um, translates to over 125 children who will be able to be sent to Camp Good Days. So. That is a great effort. Um, on other events, um, the ex officio will, will, um, has made arrangements to um, record with FMTV this week. And so the first uh, summary of the board meeting will soon be airing, which will summarize the meeting and promote other students' participation in policy. And another event is um, over the past month, some members of the uh, of the high school student government have met to convene on the school climate and brainstorm proposals um, on policy informally. But yeah, that is something to look forward to. Thank you. Thank you. And we have no one for public comment this evening. So we'll move on to item 4.01, approval of an agreement extension. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District 
Hereby authorize the superintendent to extend the agreement with Mary Coughlin for consulting services through June 30th, 2024 in an amount not to exceed the original agreement valued at $20,000. Is there a motion? <laughs> Thank you, Kelly and Daryl. Any discussion? All those in favor indicate aye. Aye. No one's opposed or abstaining. Moving to 4.02. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District makes the following appointments as presented? Is there a motion? Thank you, Jason. A second from Cindy. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. And no one's opposed or abstaining. One abstention. Oops, one abstention. Sorry. Thank you, Daryl. <clears throat> Okay, moving on to board development. As I mentioned earlier, board petitions are available for anyone wishing to run for the board. And there's information on the website or you could contact the board clerk. Um, item 5.02, potential considerations for future meetings. Um, Dr. Teich went over a couple of these, or actually the first two. Is there any additional updates, Dr. Teich, on the last three? I met uh, in the Pool Aquatic Center as I shared at the Facilities Committee meeting with uh, Town Supervisor John Deere in terms of what the town's plans and I do think they're trying to mobilize uh, a committee to take a look at this and put it before the voters possibly in November. Just a, a question about the school start time as we kind of dust off the plans and all the work the consultants did. Um, Will the, the communications team be working on sort of FAQs for the community, questions about how this will intersect with um, extracurriculars and athletics and those pieces with other districts? Because I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. Yeah, we had our initial planning meeting to take a look at the infographic. I think the board will be pleased with the format, which will allow us to kind of interchange sheets as more relevant or updated information becomes available. So yes, they're working on FAQs. Okay, moving on to item 5.02, potential considerations for future meetings. Oh, sorry, not that one, 6.01, future meetings calendar. So we'll have budget adoption at our April 15th meeting, special meeting at eight o'clock on the 17th should be a very quick meeting for the BOCES vote. Do we have quorum for that, Sarah? Do we know? Oh, you can. Yeah. What do you want to know? <laughs> uh, how many people can go if we have quorum for the April 17th meeting at eight o'clock? I plan to be here. If we don't have quorum, the time is flexible. It doesn't have to be at eight. How many do you have right now? Okay, then I will, I will adjust and I will come then on the 17th. Lots of events coming up. And then I'll move to the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? Thank you, Chrissy. Second from Jason. All those in favor, please indicate aye. 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 And no one's opposed or abstaining. Okay, so we do have a number, or several things for executive session. Um, one is the appeal of a discipline action against a student. Second is the employment of a particular corporation or individual, and two is a superintendent's evaluation. Or three, superintendent's evaluation. So those are the three things we have for executive session. Is there a motion to adjourn, excuse me, to executive session for those three matters? Thank you, Daryl. Second from Jason. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. And no one's opposed or abstaining. So we'll go into executive session and uh, adjourn from there with no further public portion of the meeting. Thank you all for coming.